Welcome to another exciting and elucidating episode of the Omni Talk Spotlight Series. I'm your host, Chris Walton. And I'm Ann Mazinga. And we are the founders of Omni Talk, the fast growing retail media organization that is all about the companies, the technologies, and the people that are coming together to shape the future of retail, or as we like to say, Anne, the media company that focuses on tomorrow's companies today. And this may be the quote unquote smartest podcast interview oh, we've ever what, done. I see what you're doing there. Do you? You yeah, see what I'm doing? I do, I do. Yeah? Well, that's because joining us today to share his expertise on the evolution of smart stores is SES Omega Tags North American CEO, Philippe Boutin. Philippe, welcome to OmniTalk. Well, thank you for having me. We are definitely excited to have you on this. Chris teased. We're going to be, this is going to be a smart episode. We're talking about smart stores, but before we do that, Philippe, I'd love for you to give us a little bit of your background and why you're an expert on smart stores. Well, expert, uh, we'll see about that. At the end. <laughs> I, I'll vouch Let for the you. audience be the you're, judge of that, yes. right, Philippe? Why, why we say you're an expert on, on the subject of smart stores then. Yeah, yeah. Well, a little bit about myself. I'm uh, I'm French, um, an engineer by background. Uh, started my career in uh, doing venture capital work. Oh. Actually, so looking at very early stage uh, tech companies uh, in Silicon Valley, and uh, that was 20, 25 years ago. And it's funny enough because back then we didn't see a lot of retail tech investments. Um, mm -hmm. We're doing a lot of, you know communication network, networking type things. And uh, after so many years of doing VC, I ended up, you know, meeting uh, as part of a transaction, I ended up meeting the, the leaders of SES. And I found the company to just be uh, fascinating, both from a, you know, technology perspective, as well as a scalability perspective. Because, um, you know, back then, IoT did not exist. Uh, AI did not really have a name for it, machine learning sure. even less, but SES was doing all that uh, and inventing some of those uh, so some of those technologies and and the scalability aspect was kind of fun too because we're you know at scale there are going to be more of our products than smartphones in the market. Um, so we're talking billions and billions of devices. Uh, so which was, you know, both from a, a tech and scale perspective, a really interesting, uh, really interesting things. And so I've been doing that for 12, 13 years now, um, innovating with our clients in retail. And so we have close to 50,000 stores running with our technologies and making stores smarter every day. Um, so, you know, we're uh, glad to be where we are, but we're also conscious of the fact that we're still at the beginning of the digital transformation journey of a lot of our clients. And so we're, we're helping them become smarter uh, by also becoming smarter ourselves. Okay. Yeah, and Philippe too, I'm curious, I'd, I'd love for you to talk more too. Where does SES and Megatag's uh, product portfolio begin and end? When you talk about those, not those devices being in, in the stores and potentially outnumbering even smartphone devices, like break that down for the audience so they get an idea of exactly what you're talking about there. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, in a, in a typical, uh, I'd say a typical supermarket, hypermarket, we can have, uh, you know, you have 30, 40,000 SKUs uh, right. in a store. Uh, obviously the bigger super centers can have 150,000 and then you have the smaller stores that can have a hundred only SKUs and we cover the whole range, right? But in a typical store, we, we end up deploying uh, sensors and IoT devices in the tens of thousands of uh, devices um, numbers. And when you multiply that by the number of stores, then it takes you to uh, you know, a huge amount of assets that we deploy in the field. And what types of things are those sensors doing for retailers? So when we, uh, <clears throat> when we started our journey, we were all about automating pricing and making sure that uh, pricing was accurate and pricing was agile. Um, and so the first function was to display information, uh, okay. display accurate product information. And our, our products evolved in a way which is kind of similar to the, you know, to the Swiss knife. Uh, you know, we had a, a knife at the beginning and then multiple, we layered a lot of additional services on top. So now we, the, the, the sensors are able to help with indoor locationing. Uh, you can help with uh, out of stock detection. You can improve uh, stocking efficiency or picking efficiency. And so they, you know, we packed all those devices with plenty of sensing techniques uh, that 
help push information to the shelf edge, but also gather a lot of information from the stores in order to uh, make them more efficient. Well, Philippe, you gave us a couple examples there, but what in, in your mind defines a smart store? Like what are the components of, of that store? Uh, now you're putting me on the spot. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> definition of a smart store, man. Yeah, of course we are. Well, uh, knowing our past, uh, you know, we like to see it as a journey uh, because there's, uh, you know, so, so some technologies are very mature. Some are in the, uh, are at different stages of maturity. Uh, but, what, you know, when you talk about smart stores, uh, I, I, at least I, I like to look at it from three different angles. What's happening within the store? Right. When looking at the store as part of a um, uh, distribution network, mm -hmm. and then looking at the store as part of uh, a community. You know, mm -hmm. stores belong to cities and belong to to communities, and so the, the, those are the three main angles I like to look at. Mm -hmm. So when you look within the store, um, a lot of what's going on in smart stores is around improving customer experiences, uh, improving efficiencies, and so there are just walk out uh, technologies, uh, you know, computer vision technologies, a lot of automation projects to you know, work on both uh, customer experiences and efficiencies. When you look at the store as part of uh, a node in the supply chain, that's an interesting way of looking at it because it's, uh, distribution is a complex element uh, mm -hmm. and it's all about bringing inventory at the right place at the right time for people to be able to shop it. And uh, not long ago, retail, the transactions were always happening in the stores. Yes. But nowadays, transactions happen at many different stages of the distribution network. You know, you can do uh, through DCs, you can do uh, on pickup in store and buy online. You can do a transaction in the store. You can do automated transactions in stores as well. So uh, making the stores smart is making it belong to this complex mm -hmm. distribution network as well. And then the last piece is, uh, you know, belonging to the community. Uh, a store is part of, uh, you know, people's lives. You go shopping in it. So you want to make sure that they use clean energy. You want to make sure that they contribute as well to, um, you know, the future of mobility. All, all, everyone is talking about making deliveries. Um, Walmart has made a few headlines recently about investing in EVs, uh, you right. know, for instance, to make, uh, to make deliveries. So how do stores contribute to the future of mobility as well? Um, and uh, and to the uh, to the clean energy aspects as well. Yeah, so, that's really ahead. well. And Chris, I know you're going to talk about you. You worked together with SES to write this article about the sustainability angle, which I think is really important for our audience to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. So often we are talking about smart stores or intelligent, like innovation <clears throat> in stores, intelligent stores as a means to be more convenient. But there is a huge angle to this. That's that's like what you're talking about, Philippe. That's you know better for the communities, leaving the the store as a more efficient place and better for the communities in which they reside in. But I'd love to hear more of like Chris from what you guys were talking about in that article and sharing that with the audience. Yeah. I mean, first of all, I mean, I want to reiterate what you said. I love that framework, mm -hmm. Philippe, that you just shared. Like I've never, I've never heard that before. That's completely new to me. Like the framework of, you know, it's, it's part of the community. It's part of a distribution network. And ultimately it's part of the consumer experience too. Like that's, that's, that's a really good way to frame up what a smart store is and it's interconnected, right. At all yes. times amongst those three different, you know, operating uh, realms, so to speak, for lack of a better way to say it. But yeah, and to your point, I mean, I recently wrote an article and I called it Today's Smart Store is Tomorrow's Sustainable Store. Yeah. And is in it, I posited that there's three ingredients to every good smart store. And, and Philippe, now I'm going to put you on the spot here because I want you to tell me like what I got right and what I got wrong. But the first thing I said that every good smart store is going to have ultimately is it's going to have the application of computer vision. Is that something you agree with? Is computer vision and its application in a quote unquote smart store essential going forward? 100%. 100%. Think, oh yeah, well, CV is everywhere, you know, in every industry, in every tech. And when you look at the, you know, the, the overall retail journey, you have CV in the farms, you have CV in logistics, you have CV in supply chain, and you have now CV in the stores for multiple different use cases, you know, whether it's uh, 
the self checkout uh, or the just walkout uh, capabilities, or as well as you know shelf monitoring capabilities. You you want to know what's on the shelf uh, in real time, and CV is pretty much the only option to really able to do that. So it it's a core and fundamental technology for for the people, of course. And and as we look to the future, like how do you think that plays out? Do you think like we it plays out with like roving cameras, like through robots? Do you it play out through fixed position cameras, shelf cameras, ceiling cameras? Like, do you have any opinion on that? I'm just curious. I've never talked to you about that before. Or asked you that before. There we go. It, it's going to be the sum of everything you listed, I think. You okay. Know, one tech never fits all. And so we're going to need to have, uh, you know, each technology is going to be able to have its sweet spot uh, use cases. Uh, we're, we're very strong believers in fixed asset cameras when it comes to, looking at the shelves, but we okay. also believe a lot in robots when it comes to doing other applications. We also need ceiling cameras just for theft purposes, as well as looking at angles in the stores, which are difficult to look at. So it's, you know, the, the sum of all the cameras that you can uh, also on the cleaning robots, that's an interesting use case mm -hmm. for, mm -hmm. for camera technologies. But, you know, we're also looking at cameras on phones uh, mm -hmm. because they are, uh, you know, edge type, you know, mobile apps can help with the detection of um, you know, leveraging the mobile phones that people have as consumers or as associates too. Right. That makes sense. I love how you said that too. Like, yes, it's really all those things. It's just a question of who's a retailer, what's the brand, what's the value proposition for each of them over time. Um, all right. The second thing that I suggested was that, and you kind of mentioned this already with the commentary on, on the smart, on the mobile phone or the smartphone for lack of a better way to say it. Um, is cloud and edge computing. What are your thoughts on that? Is that also a key ingredient here as we go forward? Well, if you're not connected, then you're out. You know, okay. Everything, <laughs> that everything clear? has to be connected to the cloud uh, in one way or the other. And then there's going to, there's going to be some edge requirements. There is going to be some, you know, centralized processing requirements when it comes to GDPR compliance security. I think the, the, the edge is really mandatory. But if it's not connected, I mean, it, it doesn't belong to the Internet of Things. Uh, and therefore, it's going to be uh, it's not going to have the ability to deliver much value in an interconnected world. So it's 100 percent cloud. We made that bet probably 10 years ago. And okay. nowadays, I, I don't know how many stores we don't install in cloud, but there are probably very, very few. Very few. Okay. So if you're on this boat, that's the way to do it. You got to be thinking about it in that direction. All right. So the last one, the last one I think I thought was really interesting, especially in what you said before about being a node in the distribution network and particularly for the calibration of supply and demand. And so that I said that electronic shelf labels, if you're really thinking about a smart store strategy, they have to be that third and final essential component there. What are your thoughts on that? I think you should come and work for us. Yes. <laughs> this is the second time this week. Second time Chris this week in a podcast. Pitched. Somebody's told me that. Yeah. yeah. It's so funny. Well, no, but we are, you know, obviously we're a little biased in this answer. Uh, mm -hmm. But again, when we started the journey of SES, it was all about price automation. Right. Uh, this was our first uh, mandate. But when we grew uh, and when, when the company evolved, we realized that ESLs were actually not a single solution type technology. It was actually a backbone technology for retailers to be able right. to have to layer multiple different services on top of each other. Mm -hmm. So pricing is one. Uh, I was talking about you know the ability to uh, detect out of stocks, that's another. Uh, improving efficiencies for picking, stocking are another. Uh, indoor locationing, every device is able to self-locate in the store. Uh, so that, that opens up you know, an array of services which make this technology really a backbone enabler for uh, plenty of things. Now, Philippe, is that it? I mean, like Chris mentioned three, I think those are really you know, critical components to a smart store. But, you know, you, you started kicking off this conversation talking about the smart store as like a multi-tool or the Swiss army knife. Like what else can you build upon now that you've kind of got some of those, those things in place, uh, ESL, you've got, you know, shelf and edge computing, um, computer vision, like what, what else is there to, to add on there? Are you asking what I forgot, Anne? Kind of. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I just want to know if Philippe has anything to add. Yeah. That's all, you know? 
It's a rare chance you get to do this. I do. This is good. I know. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think, uh, <clears throat> you know, again, we're at the beginning of the journey of putting those sensors and devices at scale in stores. Sure. Uh, we only have 500 million of those deployed, which sounds like a big number, but it's only a fraction of the market still. And so as we put more of those devices, the, the amount of data that's going to be coming out of, you know, the, the sensing and the com coming out of the stores is going to increase tremendously. Right. And so one of the next journey that we already started, but is, it's a little less visible yet, is really about data processing, AI analytics. Uh, mm -hmm. How do we use this information that we create and collect in order to get back to the store with act actionable information that they can use? Uh, one thing that, that I'm really keen about, for instance, in terms that we're not seeing very much yet is Amazon is sort of starting to do it, you know, on every product, on every ESL, they, they put the reviews of the product. Right. So it's a good first start, you know, in terms of making the shopper more educated about the products they buy, but it's only yeah. really the beginning. You know, do you do you know if such a product matches your diet requirements? Mm -hmm. Not really. Do you know if this the carbon footprint of a product you're buying in a store? Mm -hmm. You don't really know that. And so you know, being able to push out information that is really important for consumers to make the proper decisions in the stores is going to be one of the key next steps I'm really excited about. Is, is there anything else, Philippe, that, that's kind of, I mean, for me, that's like taking the online shopping experience and putting it right on the shelf. Is there anything else that you kind of hope to do to kind of simulate all of the, the benefits of that online shopping experience in a, a physical store environment? It's connecting all the dots together. You know, to, today we're seeing a lot of one-off technologies and solutions that address mm -hmm. uh, individual problems. Um, I think one of the one of these exciting things that requires and mandates the cloud is the inter interconnection. You know, okay. as a shopper myself, when I go in a store, I expect to find the right product at the right place at the right price. So how do I guarantee that as a retailer, if I'm not able to have the proper inventory position, mm -hmm. if I'm not able to guarantee that my price is right, mm -hmm. and if I don't really know where the products are in the store. Mm -hmm. So there, there, that, that leads us to you know, retailers being, off, being able to offer a, a trusted environment for shoppers where they really know that when they walk in that store, they're gonna walk out with the product they were looking for. Uh, Philippe, the, the, pro the part about data processing is another essential element that's really interesting to me. Um, it's got me thinking about a lot of things. Like, where does that begin and end in terms of, um, you know, go, like go beyond the cloud for me? Like, what other types of essential components that will enable fast data processing that retailers need to be thinking about um, are out there in your mind? There is an additional tech that we've been, that's been around for a very long time, but that hasn't really uh, taken off yet mainstream uh, outside of some verticals, some specific verticals is RFID technology where, you know, there, it's been, uh, you know, can, can you really think about a smart store if you're not able to have smart products as well in the store? Right. Uh, so that boils into the evolution of, uh, you know, product packaging or the labeling of products to make sure that they're, that the products themselves are able to be uh, self-aware as well as their uh, position in the supply chain and position in stores. Yeah, that's a great point, Anne, because like we actually, when I wrote the article and put it on social media, there was a lot of people commenting on mm -hmm. that angle too. So I'm really, that's really smart that we brought that up. All right, so let's talk. So we talked a lot about what what is a smart store. Now let's talk about the why of a smart store. So sure, there are all the operational benefits that we've talked about. Um, which I'd love for you to touch on more if you want to, but the, the much greater why to me that I know is also very important to you is namely around sustainability. So you, you mentioned a little bit already, but talk to us about why a smart store is such an essential ingredient of making our, our everyday retail operations more sustainable. Yeah, that's a good question. So <clears throat> there, there, there are two, uh, Two areas that we uh, that are sensitive that we're sensitive to the the first one is around waste mm -hmm. uh, and the reduction of waste and the other one is around the uh, you know the carbon footprint let's say so when it when it comes to waste uh, how do we you know it's hard to think of a smart store that has a high shrink rate 
right? So right. how do we, <laughs> That's a great point. you know, where, you know, perishable get lost uh, or unsold uh, and they have to be, uh, so how do you, that's a topic that doesn't really have a simple answer. Um, and we're not experts in that field, but you know, we're definitely uh, interested in understanding how we can participate in the reduction of uh, waste overall, you know, by helping you know, clients reduce, manage their inventories better or manage their markdown better in case of perishables or due dates coming up soon. So. That's definitely one area of, uh, of interest to us. The other one is the um, carbon reduction. I, I'd say, I, I'll give you an example of a, a client that came to us recently with a question we didn't really have an answer for, uh, but it was a good question. Uh, so if you have ideas, I'm, I'm interested too. But they were, they were, and I, I think it applies to a lot of clients. Um, they were wondering which was best from a sustainability perspective between investing in stores, in digital solutions for stores in order to make them more productive or investing in distribution centers in order to, to be able to have more automated warehouses. And the intent of the investment was to, should I invest in the store in order to deliver my shopper faster or should I invest in a DC to deliver my shopper faster, and what's the what's the environmental impact of choice A versus choice mm, B? Interesting. Which is an interesting way of looking at it because everyone is making investments in both, mm -hmm. uh, but never with the or never uh, hardly ever with the angle of looking at it from a sustainability perspective. Mm -hmm. it's better to build a new building or to le leverage the existing ones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the location of those buildings too, right? I mean, that's the part for me. In the discussion about the sustainable store is there's the by locate by definition the locations of the store are closer to consumers and so if you can think about whether it's new build or retrofitting existing operation with the types of technologies we're talking about that inherently has sustainable properties to me in relation to the other option because you're closer to the consumer you know you get the more fluid the more fluid fluidity around the inventory going through the store the more calibration to supply and demand on pricing as we've talked about less waste that to me feels like a more sustainable solution. I don't know what you think, Anne. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I'd love to hear too, Philippe, like as we kind of close this out, what advice you would give to retailers who are starting to think about the store journey, a smart store journey, um, especially when they're trying to elevate the priority of sustainability and like that that's becoming like you just gave in your example, you know, as important in some cases as uh, profitability and, and investment where where do they begin like what what would you recommend that they do as they're trying to like come up with their their smart store strategy well they can come to us <laughs> <laughs> have a conversation to begin with i yeah. love it <laughs> right to the <laughs> point i think well for, we, we have a bit of experience because we we've equipped like close to fifty thousand stores across the world so we can uh, by, by having a conversation and um, I, I mean sharing experiences and understanding you know what the what the main pain points are a lot of clients are coming to us today with inflationary pressure pressures uh, right. difficulties to find labor um, and you know th this is a typical engagement for us when you have uh, operations issues mm -hmm. and we have plenty of solutions for that short term but you know a lot of times you know, we can also help in you know doing a bit of strategic planning work uh, and working with uh, the because not, not everybody has you know our tech in their radar in the next one or two years it can be a longer term investment and so we're also happy to have those conversations about how to look uh, how to look, uh, how to embed those kind of technologies in a five-year plan. Philippe, as a follow-up to that, I think one question that I've been, I've been reading a lot about that I have uh, is, you know, how long should, should retailers who are listening to this be thinking about um, a return on investment or um, like seeing some positives come out of these big investments? Because they are, they are, huge when you start to look at, you know, what the price tag is for some of these things. 
how do you, how do you recommend that they kind of approach saying this is, this is when we'll see the payback for this investment in technology. It's not a choice anymore. I don't think where they can say, I'm, I'm going to be a smart store. I'm not, but like, how would you, how do you explain that to some of the clients that you've worked with and, and what's kind of your perspective on that? You know, it, it happens quite often that when we start a conversation, people think that the ROI is very long. And yeah. at the end of the conversation, the ROI is usually pretty short. Okay. Uh, because there is, you know, when you look at this investment as a backbone technology and as a mandatory investment in order to be able to really deliver on the digital transformation strategy, then it becomes, you know, a no brainer that this is an important not only important, but also a super fast ROI tip. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's especially true now because it feels like there's a lot of heat coming on this discussion. Like right. I know I'm on stage monitoring a panel at grocery shop. Um, and this is one of the top, one of the topics that's, you know, particularly the application of ESL is like mm -hmm. was discussed before by Philippe that many, many gro more grocers are looking at very, very consciously. Yes. Um, and across all the use cases too, like you said, like as a foundational element of the store design, whether they be, you know, used for managed for pricing, for in-store picking, third-party picking, and even inventory placement by way of robots and scanning. So um, anything else you want to add on that, Philippe? So I was just, uh, you know, thinking that not many clients that we talk to imagine still being able to manage their stores manually with paper mm -hmm. or right. people walking around doing gap scans, you know, the... Right. The way we used to do it is not the way we're going to do it. And so it, it's really a matter of figuring out, you know, who's ready to do it now versus a year from now versus two years from now. This is not an, a NIF type question. It's just a when. Yeah, yes. right. It's like the other part, we just had an interview with, with Art Sebastian at Casey's too. Like he opened our eyes to, yeah, if you're still using paper, right. that's probably a place to identify that you can do this better and you can right. do this differently. Should be so like so always a good reminder for everyone out there to close upon. So, all right, well, thank you, Philippe. That was great. Um, if people want to get in touch with you, learn more about SES and Magotag, what's the best way for them to do that? What's the best way for them to get in touch with you? So LinkedIn or email are the best way to reach me uh, or our website, of course, whichever, whichever people prefer. And uh, for the lucky ones, I'll give myself a phone. All right. All right. Yeah. All right. Just reach out to get the digits. The from digits. Philippe. Yeah. He'll give you his number. Wow. All right. Good. All right. Well, hey, that wraps us up. Thanks to Philippe Boutin, the CEO of North, Amer North America for SES and Magatag. Thanks for sitting down with us today, Philippe. And as always, to everyone listening, be careful out there.